figure that out. That is from um, the, the picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's from Peru. Okay. When I was there. Did you, did you do Machu Picchu? I do Machu Picchu. Yeah. yeah did we, you? We oh, we did. We climbed the Wana Picchu, the mountain in the background that you see in the, yeah. every one of the pictures. We climbed it right to the tip. I was the old guy. Sorry. That's okay. I'm Are we live now? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, well, call the uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, please take the roll. On the roll, Mr. Strawn. Here. Ms. Baker. Here. Mr. Tumba. Here. Here. Ms. Simon. Here. Ms. Stevens. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, has there been any public comment in regards to the meeting? No, Mr. Chair, no one submitted any public comment. Okay. Uh, the minutes uh, of the April uh, 19th meeting, has everybody had a chance to look at them? Okay. Uh, the chair asks for a motion to approve the minutes of the, the meeting. Oh, so move. Second. Move. Between me and, and uh, the chair. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any discussion? It's right. Uh, hearing no discussion, all in favor of approval of the minutes, say aye. 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 And uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, the chair will take uh, uh, its discretionary time to say that uh, for anybody who has not seen the exciting. Uh, Today's uh, newspaper of Crane's Cleveland Business, or yesterday's, uh, one of our colleagues, Cheryl Stevens, uh, has a very, very nice article in there uh, in regards to women in business. And uh, so congratulations to you. Uh, well done. But you're on mute, so we couldn't hear your your, 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 your voice uh, telling us. Thanks, Thank Cheryl. You. Appreciate it very much. Thank you so uh, well, much. You're welcome. Well deserved. Uh, looks you. like if you, if you have, are not up to speed in regards to it, uh, please go back and read it because it, she's doing some uh, fantastic things in Summit County and uh, congratulations on, on that. Uh, with that, we have one item uh, for the agenda uh, to be read in the record. If it could be read in the record, please. Resolution number 2021-0159, adopting the 2021 five-year economic development plan in accordance with section 7.05 of the Cuyahoga County Charter and section 801.01 of the Cuyahoga County Code. And is uh, just for uh, everybody's recollection, last year uh, there was this little thing called the pandemic. And uh, if anybody maybe refresh people's memory on that, and it uh, tended to slow down our five year plan. And this body uh, did uh, they were going to focus on the one year. And but however, we were not going to ignore the five year. And so, with that, uh, is there anyone here that uh, is prepared to speak to the plan? And it looks like we also have. Uh, uh, our good friend David Gilbert also here, uh, at least online. So, uh, Paul, I assume it's going to be you, but yes. I didn't hear your volunteer, so I volunteered you. Yes. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Paul Herded with the Department of Development. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. And uh, if this is working, you should all be seeing my first slide, which is just my title slide. Um, before talking about the update of the five-year plan, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to all the members of council that have been very supportive and helpful as I stepped into the duties of your interim director of development for the last three months now. Um, I can honestly say that all my interactions with council members have been um, straightforward, candid, collegial, and I just greatly appreciate the spirit in which our policymaking body supports the work of the administrative staff. Um, together, I believe we're going to continue to do some great things in the field of economic development. So um, to extend the chair's introductory remarks, this has been an extraordinary year, an unusual year. We, um, none of us could have anticipated at the beginning of 2020 how 2020 was going to go. And so um, when we adopted the, the plan for the year, let me go back one, as, as uh, the chair said, 
we said we, we're going to need to focus on the short term, which is not something you usually do when doing a strategic plan. And even though a year ago, none of us really knew how bad things would be or how um, challenging they would be, how long it would take, I think that with the support of our uh, Economic Development Commission and this committee, we we're able to make a sensible plan with some, with some elements which have borne fruit. So I'd like to review um, just a few highlights of the last year, e even under the conditions we had to work under. We responded to the dire situation facing many of our small businesses by giving grants to our small businesses. We were able using CARES Act resources, some other resources to put out over $8.68 million in grants to small businesses many of them the industries hardest hit by the pandemic. Those such as um, food and retail, where you really can't do what you do remotely. We did this along with a network of partners and we're gonna hear a little bit later from a representative, one of our partners, the Urban League of Greater Cleveland. We were also able, despite the pandemic, to do some pretty substantial funding of economic development projects. So just to review over the last year, we funded the Gojo company to establish a new manufacturing plant in Maple Heights that brought 200 jobs. We funded them for three and a half million dollars. We funded the Centennial Project, which is finally going to bring back to life the long vacant building right in the core of our downtown, the old um, Huntington Bank, or before that Union Trust building, for five million. We funded another project, um, which is going to redevelop a long vacant building, the Warner and Swayze building in Midtown for a million dollars. And most recently, we funded Jumpstart, Ray will be here, but we funded Jumpstart with an, a new injection of capital, $5 million for the next two fund to further support innovation. So altogether, um, despite the pandemic, we're, we've put $14.5 million into play for economic development. We've continued our work supporting our Workforce Connect program, our sector partnerships, as um, you'll recall, we had an update near the end of 2020, and we're going to be recommending continuing support for that work going forward. You'll hear a little bit more about the workforce work from Frank Brickner in just a moment. And I'm especially proud that thinking again of our support for small businesses through our partners, we were able to support 247 small businesses in the last year and funnel to them an additional $1.4 million financial assistance over and above what we did directly. These were some of our highlights. While we all worked under um, remote conditions and ever-changing landscape, I would note that when we turn to the next phase, we're in a bit of a transitional period here, as I'll talk about when we talk about the plan, where I think it's a little bit up in the air to see how long this disruption of labor, mar labor market will last, um, how downtown office space is going to recover, but we're definitely beginning to see the signs of return to normalcy. So that being said, um, I'd like to now turn to just a little bit of an update and assessment of each of the key areas that was in our one-year plan. We indicated we would continue to invest and support our small minority businesses. We would invest and expand innovation we would accelerate and scale our workforce initiatives and try to reduce unemployment. We would then work to market the county locally and nationally. And having done that, we would then turn towards coming back to our longer term planning. So um, now to give a little bit of an assessment of where we've come in each of these areas, I have invited um, four experts in each of these areas to say a few words to this committee. And I will, um, ask um, with the chair's assistance that we welcome any brief questioning that would relate to each of the four um, when they finish their remarks. I, of course, will be available throughout this meeting you know, to answer questions to the committee. So with the chair's permission, I would first like to turn to Shoshana Duckworth from the Urban League of Greater Cleveland, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the work we did together in our network of small business assistance partners over the past year. All right, thank you very much for that, Paul. So as Paul said, I'm Shoshana Duckworth, Director of the Small Business Development Center at Urban League of Greater Cleveland. The entrepreneurial ecosystem that exists within our county has really worked to ensure that our local small businesses 
are able to receive the technical assistance that they are in need of, especially with everything going on with COVID. From one-on-one business advisory services to understanding and completing the applications for COVID relief funding, we have been there to assist. In total, the BGC, which consists of 11 of our partner organizations within the county, has served over 1,100 unique clients um, who have received assistance through the referral process that BGC has in place. Of these businesses, 80% of them were Black or Brown. Through the joint support efforts, clients reported infusing over $15 million in capital into their businesses and generating over $65 million in revenue. In addition to that, these same businesses were able to create and or retain 840 jobs. The businesses, the, the over 200 businesses that Paul mentioned are a part of these numbers as well. Within our ecosystem, we have always had a natural synergy and able to work together to service the small businesses within our county. But this year, we have been able to more effectively service these clients from a holistic approach, from accessing capital to applying for the relief funding that's available to gathering documentation to making sure they understand that process. Something that we continue to make a focus is ensuring that these small businesses are becoming bankable because a lot of our small businesses within the county are still experiencing lender fatigue as I call it because they're used to being told no going into the banks and they're looking to when they're looking to receive funding so we've been working with the small businesses to help them become more bankable making sure that all of their financials are in order making sure that their books are in order before these relief funding programs are actually rolled out because what happens is when they're rolled out, either one, they're not applying because they, they're afraid to apply or maybe their documentation is not together. So we are working closely with these small, with small businesses in the county to make sure that all the documentation are in order. And we have been seeing some great improvements. So a lot more, a lot of our businesses are now applying for these relief funding. The numbers are increasing in comparison to when these relief programs initially rolled out. A lot of the businesses weren't applying. A lot of our businesses are applying right now. Um, we have listened to the ecosystem and also our small businesses and have decided to implement a six part marketing series. Due to the overwhelming effect that COVID has had on our small businesses, a lot of them are looking to either strengthen their brand or their virtual presence, or even maybe pivot or transition to a virtual platform. So we developed this series where we're able to work with businesses to get them um, just efficient with marketing, understanding the marketing, but then also perfect their marketing from social media to branding to website designing. The great thing that I'm excited about with this new initiative is that they're able to receive these services at no cost to them. So if they're in need of a website, we can get that design for them at no cost. If they're in need of maybe just strengthening their website, that as well. Social media branding and marketing, we can get that at no cost. And then also print marketing. For the next few weeks, our efforts are highly geared towards providing technical assistance for the four new grant programs that the governor released that will go live tomorrow. Will go live tomorrow. So we are actually, I'm actually in the process of putting together a presentation for that to make sure that our businesses are aware of the documentations that they need to have together to make sure that all of their questions are addressed and make sure that they get their application in sooner rather than later, because we have seen with all of the other funding opportunities that we want to make sure that the businesses get their applications in. So we are working together with all of the other 10 organizations to make sure that all of the businesses within the county are aware of these four new grant programs that just got rolled out. That is it for me. I'll give it over back over to you, Paul. Thank you, Shoshana. And um, one additional point I'd like to note before I turn it back to the chair to see if there's any questions. Um, the Department of Development has released a procurement, a formal request for qualifications for $3 million for organizations like the Urban League to provide ongoing assistance to small businesses over the next two years. Once we receive the various responses, which we're, will be due in the middle of July, 
And of course, they'll be reviewed by a panel, which includes some outside experts as well as county staff. We will, of course, be coming back to county council with recommended awards. And I would anticipate that the legislation would certainly be referred to this committee. So at that time, we'll be able to have a very thorough discussion of some of the work that we will be proposing to fund over the next two year period. Um, I will just say that strategically, we recognize the importance of small businesses, both as job creators and as ways when how individuals can begin to amass personal wealth. And so it has always been and will continue to be one of the key points of our economic development plan to support the growth of small businesses. Um, Jack, at this point, if you wanted to have any questions for Shoshana on this topic. Okay, and you, your preference is for us to ask each one after each one of the breaks off their sessions. Is that, is that correct on that, Paul? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. it's great. Uh, any questions from the, from the committee for Mrs. Duckworth? This is usually not a shy committee. I, and I saw Mr. Miller join us. Uh, well, and, um, tell me about the four programs that were just announced. I saw them myself on a, on a blast today. And uh, what, what do they mean? And how are we as a county gonna help our county candidates who might be, uh, who might be eligible for these four programs for the state? Okay, so the, the four programs are, one of them is for the entertainment and venue industry. One is for lodging the lodging industry, food and beverages, and then one that I'm really excited about that was put out there is for new businesses as well, businesses who were started in 2019. What we're doing to make sure that the county is aware of this is we're working together with the BGC, I mentioned that our ecosystem that we strongly support in making sure that one, the information get out there, but we're a resource available to make sure that these small businesses are available to answer, that we're available to answer any questions. So. As I stated, I actually started putting together a presentation. We will have the first webinar actually on Wednesday. So there will be a virtual webinar on Wednesday that will go through and explain each one of these grants and also answer any questions that the small businesses have. And then they will be provided with links and or phone numbers to make sure that they get on the schedule with the certified business advisor to walk them through the application process if they need assistance with it. We are even meeting small businesses in our office in our computer lab to walk them through the application process to make sure that all of their questions get answered. Is this a first to the uh, a filing uh, who gets the money or is it is the are there going to be funds sufficient to, to handle any application requests? So they did separate it. The state did separate it per county. So each one has a specific amount allocated towards each county between 100 to 150,000. Once each county has use of the amount that was allocated towards them at the end, any additional amounts will be dispersed evenly. Well, oh, first, so first, 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 basis. Yeah. So first, we, we, we use our 150, we can go after more. And I see, yes. uh, I see Mr. Gilbert, uh, three of those programs should be right in his sweet spot as far as it sounds like uh, for his, his clientele out there. The one thing to really um, pay attention to too with the one for small business, the new business, because a lot of people were kind of afraid of that one, but they do have to have at least two W-2 employees. At the, um, start of the, at the start of 2020, they had to at least, at least have two W-2 employees. So the... The wife hires the husband uh, to get the two, right? Is that the way that goes? <laughs> we, we, all of us who have been in small business understand how that program works. Yeah. Right. <laughs> any any questions for anybody else uh, after the chairs asked them? Hearing none. If I may, Chair, oh, yeah. I, I may Go have ahead. a question for you. Yep. Just um, maybe just trying to get a little bit better understanding. So, if a small business owner, uh, let's say they wanted to open up a business and mm -hmm. of course the bank will not uh, loan them because they're too high of a risk. Uh, mm -hmm. And they hear of you and come to you and say, I want to open up my own hair salon and I work for a hair salon. I know what I'm doing, but I never owned one before. What can you do for them? What is it that you would offer them to guide them into perhaps either reapplying for a bank loan or waiting until they had more resources? What type of, uh, just to give me an idea of what your services are. That's a great question. So what we do is I like to say we take the businesses from point A to point Z. 
So from the ideation phase through sustainability or growth and development. So if a business come in the door and it's a new startup business, the first thing we want to do is take them through our startup track. Okay, that startup track includes a webinar. It's titled Starting Your Business in Ohio. It is a state webinar um, where through the State Development Service Agency, where they go through and learn everything about starting your business from EIN numbers to registering your business. We have someone there from Workers' Comp, Melanie with the State Workers' Comp. She's there and she speaks on Workers' Comp and the importance of having it um, going through and just really breaking down everything they need to know about starting their business. After that, the second part of that that program is for them to meet with a business advisor to register their business. So we walk them through the process of doing a search for the name, registering their business, and then taking them through the IRS process to get their EIN number, getting them to understand that they don't have to pay anyone for that process. We offer it at no cost. And then after that, right now, we actually have a technical writer on our team who is sitting down with business at, with, with new businesses and existing businesses who are five years or younger and helping them write business plans. So our businesses are leading with full comprehensive business plans. After they meet with their business advisor, throughout this time, at any time they can sit and meet, that, meet with their certified business advisor, each person that comes in is assigned their own personal business advisor. So they can meet at any time with that business advisor and they work with that business advisor to put together an action plan. So you mentioned, you know, a hair salon needing capital. So the first thing that that business advisor has to do is one, determine what is their need. And what, what do they need that need? What do they need funds for? But then also determine if they're bankable. Okay. We work closely with ECDI. We have our UBS loan fund and we work closely with the city's Department of Economic Development and then also um, all of the traditional financial institutions as well. So we work with every institution to make sure that all of them are available to small businesses. So after evaluating that business and that business's needs, then that business advisor will begin to put a financial plan together for that business. Let's just say the best route for them to go is ECDI. So what we will do is start to package them. If they're ready, once they're ready, we start to package them for an ECDI loan. Once all of the documents are gathered, we perfected everything, we made sure everything was ready, then we put them in front of ECDI so that they can access ECDs, ECDI, one of ECDI's funding programs, and the same thing with all of the other lending partners. Or if they qualify for ours, our, our, our loan program that we have with our UBIS loan pro program that we have, um, thanks to the support of the county, Jumpstart, and a few others, is only for existing businesses. So with that program, if they don't qualify for that, if they qualify for that program, then we put them in front of that one. If that's not the best program for them, we determine what the best program is for them and put them in front of it. And if I may, Chair. Sure. So once they've gone through that process and they're at the end where, okay, I want to open my space. I have a couple of people that I'm going to hire and I don't have much money, but uh, I have a lot of ambition. How do you get them from the, the goal to the reality of okay. actually opening up those doors? Some of it is a hard conversation. And that's why the business advisors are certified to have those conversations. It's making sure that not only are the businesses ready, but understanding what's involved with that process, understanding what's involved with running a business. They may not be ready at that point, we can still put an action plan together and let them know what they need to do to get ready and have that serious conversations with them. But a lot of, there are some, biz, a, lot, a large percentage of businesses that come through our doors that are not really ready. And that's why we have the startup track that we take them through that process. Because by the end of that process, a lot of those businesses who are not ready have already fallen off and said, I'm not ready yet. I'll come back when I'm ready. Okay. And if I may, just, you know, curious, fascinating program. Do you, um, have a percentage of those that walk in the door that have all the ambition? How many make it to the end that you say, we think you have the tools, um, startup dollars, and here is the road to uh, meeting what it is that your expectations bring you? I mean, what, what, how many would you say out of, say out of 10? Do you get 50% of those or? I would say out of 10, um, we stay in communication with probably at least 80 to 90% because okay. 
they're still not ready, even if they're not ready at that point, they're still coming back asking questions or we're even following up saying, hey, here's some more information, here's some more webinars, because when they're not ready, a lot of times they still come back and take advantage of the webinars and the educational pieces that are offered. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate the chance to ask a few questions. No, no. Great, great questions. Uh, any other questions? From Councilman? And, I, and I did see that uh, it blipped on my screen, though I don't see his, his face, uh, that Mr. Miller signed in uh, also to be with us. Uh, so with that, um, any other questions for anybody? Paul, is it your envisioning that this new program that was just launched today, or I guess I think I saw it today too, also uh, will be incorporated in the five-year plan now that it's new? Uh, thank you for the question, Councilman. I would say that this um, funding furthers the initiatives that are already embedded in our plan so that what we're doing is putting money behind what we've already said is important to us, which is supporting the growth and development of small business. So we would anticipate certainly reporting to both the commission and the committee on the outcomes of this work. Um, but I will say that I don't think it represents a drastic change of direction from what we've tried to do over the past four or five years. Yeah, is what Ms. Duckworth uh, mentioned. It sounds like that fourth new option is very similar to what we just did with the Jumpstart program for new business out there. It just has a little bit more funding, another another source of funding. Yes. Okay, uh, is there, who is next? Um, thank you very much. So uh, for moving your on, very thank nice. you, Chair. Um, we also wanted to note um, progress on innovation over the last year. And this committee did already hear from Mr. Leach in a previous meeting as we approved a $5 million new investment in Jumpstart's Next2 fund. Um, I also asked Ray if he would talk a little more generally about what was accomplished in the um, innovation support ecosystem over the last year, because we had quite an exciting development with the release of a, a pretty broadly based plan. Um, and while we don't have Beju Shah here today to really uh, pontificate on it. I think that Ray can also do a good job of, of summarizing that in his remarks. Right. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, County uh, Council leadership and members for uh, hearing me out a little bit around the Restore Cuyahoga innovation strategies and tactics. So first, I'm going to talk about something called the Cleveland Innovation Project. Uh, Beju Shaw has been the leader of the Cleveland Innovation Project, now obviously the leader of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Uh, but Beiji was doing that originally representing the Cleveland Foundation. So the four other founding members of the Cleveland Innovation Project are Jumpstart, Team NEO, the Fund for Economic Future, and the Greater Cleveland Partnership, of course, which now Beiji is, is leading. So the goal and objective of the Cleveland Innovation Project, uh, which we're very pleased to have a partnership with Cuyahoga County on, is to strengthen the technology-led economic growth and prosperity of all residents of Cuyahoga County and Greater Cleveland. So we're looking for ways to leverage uh, impactful industries such as smart manufacturing, water and healthcare, uh, how to boost uh, or how to solve for the digital divide across the county, as well as how to address our most important talent and STEM issues. Fourthly, which the county has been very supportive to a handful of organizations, but specifically to Jumpstart is around capital and then finally, the, the fifth area of focus for the Cleveland Innovation Project is focused on enhancing our uh, primary innovation zones uh, in the city and in the county, and with a likely focus on Midtown Cleveland uh, in the near term, given the activities of the Cleveland Foundation and others uh, in Midtown. So while the Cleveland Innovation Project has been going on kind of behind the scenes for almost two years now, we're really... Uh, excited about the role that uh, the five founding organizations and partners such as the county uh, can uh, play, particularly as we catalyze uh, American Rescue Plan dollars, resources, and other things coming from the federal government uh, uh, over the coming months. So we're really, in years, we're really excited that we've kind of laid the groundwork not, of course, just across the five organizations, but all of our collective partners, both the county's partners, as well as the, the five founding Cleveland Innovation Project collaborators. So as an example, maybe you didn't hear the organization Magnet or you didn't hear the organization, the Cleveland Water Alliance, as founding members of the Cleveland Innovation Project, but 
this project is very, very, very much going to be using organizations such as those to champion and deploy the programmatic work uh, across the county. So at the end of the day, um, while this project was founded by five organizations, it's gonna end up having dozens, if not hundreds of organizations that are benefited and or partnered with the Cleveland Innovation Project over the coming decade. To give just another little wrinkle to what might be an area of focus uh, or an outcome in an area of focus with the Cleveland Innovation Project, I'll just talk a minute about capital. So capital, again, is one of the five principal areas. And I, as the CEO of Jumpstart, but in this context, I'm kind of the, the chief bottle washer or the ringleader around all things capital. So as part of the Cleveland Innovation Project, what we are aspiring to achieve is to be able to raise and invest $4 billion in innovation capital uh, out of Greater Cleveland by 2030. And that half of those capital projects that would receive investment from the private sector, public sector, uh, philanthropy and others, half those projects would be led by women. And at least 20% of those projects would be led by black uh, leaders in our community. And at least 5% of these projects would be led by Hispanic, Latina, Latino uh, leaders from Cuyahoga County and greater Cleveland. So we have this big aspiration, $4 billion in capital, but we're also equally as energized and focused on uh, ensuring, you know, 4 billion would be great, but 4 billion with half of the dollars deployed in partnership with women leaders and a quarter of the dollars minimum uh, invested in projects led by uh, people of color, as I indicated, is a, is a core priority of uh, the capital work stream of the Cleveland Innovation Project. I'd also want to emphasize, so then whether it's in smart industry or in uh, strategic industries like smart manufacturing, health innovation, and water, we have an equal focus around equity, participation, engagement, benefit of all residents uh, from our community, and the same would be true course for digital divide and STEM talent. So all these uh, um, areas of focus, which represent dynamic collaborations, accessing public, private, and philanthropic resources is really at the core of the uh, Cleveland Innovation Project. And of course, having this project be a critical part of the county strategy uh, is incredibly valuable. Um, and, you know, along what I would say along with that, that's been very encouraging is that the level of collaboration and problem solving across our entire public, private, philanthropic, nonprofit uh, community is at an all time high. Part of that was some of the learnings over the last decades. Others was additional learning because of COVID. And I feel like uh, all those things together are going to make a really meaningful difference in terms of the way we work together and, of course, uh, impact greater outcomes uh, broadly in the, econ in the innovation economy in the near term. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And then the last thing more briefly is I did want to share. Well, first, I wanted to uh, send my uh, thanks and appreciation on behalf of our board for the county support of Jumpstart's most recent uh, venture fund. Um, you may or may not have seen news last week. The original visioning was that Jumpstart would raise a $30 million fund and that the county would provide a $5 million loan uh, to that fund. But we, we did release that the fund is going to be $50 million, 5 zero. Uh, we did a first close on the fund last week um, at a number well above the halfway point of the $50 million. So we exceeded basically our original goal already with many, many other corporations and institutions preparing to make a commitment, but have yet to do so. And they have a few months to be able to do that. And one of the reasons why uh, we did a first close of the fund last week is we're preparing to make our very first announcement of an investment, which is a very exciting company headquartered in the city of Cleveland. Uh, it's a software business at the intersection of healthcare uh, and, uh, and I can't say anything more than that quite yet because it's not mine to announce, but it'll be announced eminently and will be a great representation of the kinds of investments that uh, our next fund or next two fund uh, will be making going forward, leveraging great entrepreneurial talent in our community, our healthcare uh, ecosystem, either as a first client or as a strategic partner. 
Um, so I would expect that that $50 million fund, again, headquartered at Jumpstart, uh, focused on companies in Cuyahoga County will generate uh, likely to be 350 to 500 million in private investment uh, as a result of this founding 50 million over the next five years. Um, so those were the two uh, major areas of focus I wanted to talk about today in relationship to innovation and we're happy to answer questions. Uh, and I, on behalf of the innovation ecosystem in Cuyahoga County, I, I want to send our collective appreciation for your support and partnership. Uh, thank you, uh, Ray, uh, in regards to that. Uh, questions from uh, the committee? Okay, this is not usually the shy quick committee. But so. Well, I, I do. Okay, all right, Chair, go ahead. To Mr. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, thanks for being here. My question just relates generally to COVID and the year um, we've had to incubate new businesses really and how that translates now with optimism about people having that space to really just be in their cocoon and, and how that might emerge now with new businesses and growth. Well, there was a recent survey basically saying that 25% of Americans wanna launch new businesses as of right now. Yeah. And 90% of those businesses or 90% of the Americans who wanna launch a new business, the reason why they are maybe not as far along as they'd like is access to capital. So uh, I'm very pleased to be a partner with the county uh, on the small business side of our work, obviously in collaboration with the Urban League and, and other partners, but also on the tech side. So I think what we need to really uh, keep our eyes on is how can we, uh, as an economic development ecosystem, optimally leverage access to capital and a combination of entrepreneurial services. So I'll just do another wrinkle down that hopefully you'll find very encouraging. As part of the American Rescue Plan, uh, that President Biden signed back in March, and obviously uh, um, we're, we're excited about the prospects of that. There was over $10 billion, in addition to all the grant activity that's going on um, as part of the COVID relief, as, Amer as part of ARP, there's $10 billion in capital that's being made available to the states and U.S. territories uh, to support small business with a particular focus on socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. And these are businesses of all types. Uh, the state of Ohio is gonna end up receiving between 150 and $170 million of grant money from treasury, which will then be deployed in loan funds as well as innovation funds like Jumpstarts and others across the state. So um, we are um, at the table talking to the team at the governor's office, along with obviously many partners to think about how could we leverage a good portion of this uh, 150 to 175 million dollars to benefit uh, owner founders, owners of businesses in Cuyahoga County. Um, and we've really got a laser focus on that with the belief that if we could um, access a significant or material percentage of those dollars, it could end up you know, with hundreds of millions of dollars of new capital being made available, both as loans as well as equity investments to uh, Cuyahoga County founders and small businesses. So, you know, we're in a very unusual time for lots of reasons, so lots of challenges, but also we have incredible opportunities to access these resources and we have the team uh, again, on the small business side and on the innovation side to position ourselves favorably vis-a-vis -vis perhaps other counties or regions of the state to get more than our fair share. So I'm, I'm encouraged. There's a huge demand. Jumpstart has not seen more demand for innovation capital uh, in the last five years and we're seeing right now. For instance, we made four investments last week. Um, uh, in technology-driven innovation companies in the, ca in the, in the county. So um, now's the time to, uh, to leverage all this hard work that we've done individually and collectively to get more than our fair share. And I'm, I'm encouraged we'll be able to do that. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chairman. Chair, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, at some of our recent meetings of the Aerozone Alliance, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the possibilities for drone technology and the role that, that Greater Cleveland could, could play in the development of that industry. And uh, I would be interested in your comments on uh, 
what our prospects are for uh, for being a strong participant in that area and how we plan to pursue it. Thank you, Can Councilman Miller. Yes, I'm a founding board member of the Arizona uh, Board, uh, or I guess 2.0 of the board. They've moved out of the uh, the planning process and now into the implementation process. So I just recently accepted. Uh, a board seat there. And we also already, as you know, we have a partnership with NASA in regards to kind of the big picture of leveraging technology from, uh, from NASA Glenn. Having said that, I think, I think we're all very much aware uh, of the, the possibilities and the impact of drone technology across our entire society. Uh, yeah, delivering pizzas is one thing, but it can do a whole lot more than that. So we're very excited and encouraged about uh, not only the, the, the evolution of the industry, but uh, Jumpstart's assets, whether that's to invest or our, our ability to coach uh, or attract very early stage companies to Cuyahoga County to, uh, to partner in this area. I think this, the drone area in general should be uh, a principal and primary area of focus, particularly since that aspect of, of the commercialization, we're right in the early days, but it's going, it's active uh, around drone technology. So I would hope we'd have some of our big uh, and first early wins uh, in collaboration with the Aerozone in that area. And that you know, we intend to focus in that area in the weeks and months uh, in year or two going forward. Great, thanks very much. Uh, Chair, I have a question. Okay. Sure, Ms. Baker. So today in Board of Control, we approved um, 500,000 for um, Brownfield uh, for the um, Magnet, who is opening up the uh, Margaret Island School building. And they have some pretty big plans on trying to uh, bring manufacturing to a level that would encourage many of our young people to uh, entertain that idea. And I know earlier in the economic plan, manufacturing was uh, certainly a focus of uh, what we wanted to see more of and encourage more of. So, uh, and I know it's not part of your five, I believe that you mentioned. It actually five. is, uh, Councilwoman Baker. It's one of the three primary smart indus or industry drivers. So it's smart manufacturing, digital healthcare and water. Yes. So on the Cleveland Innovation Project, manufacturing is an incredibly important pillar of that initiative. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry to interrupt if you want to do no, a... I just I guess I just wanted to know the, um, you know, are you involved at all in yeah. their efforts to get this um, very, it seems like a very uh, innovative and um, pretty high level... Uh, endeavor that they're making, moving out of one building and, right. and taking ownership of another. Yeah, so let me talk about just a couple other intersections between Jumpstart and Magnet. First, the Magnet building is approximately seven blocks from Jumpstart's current location in Midtown. So mm -hmm. getting them closer, more proximate in all sorts of ways is helpful. Uh, that's number one. Number two is Jumpstart did launch a smart manufacturing innovation fund in partnership with Magnet. So recently, the uh, Jumpstart was awarded uh, $19 million from the state of Ohio, and uh, a couple million of those uh, we are leveraging to create a fund in collaboration and partnership with Magnet to be focused on very early stage uh, technologies uh, in smart manufacturing. So the average investment might be a half a million dollars uh, in uh, eight to 10 new innovations. And then the third thing I'd mention is you may be aware Magnet just recently announced a blueprint for manufacturing that has dozens, if not hundreds of partners and stakeholders looking to play their particular role to advance, advance uh, manufacturing in our community, particularly from a workforce perspective and Jumpstart is a founding member uh, of that blueprint. So uh, unlike maybe uh, seven to 10 years ago where Magnet would be doing its thing and Jumpstart would be doing its own thing and maybe by happenstance, we'd figure out where the win-win is. Today, we're building these strategies collectively and collaboratively from the ground up. Um, I think we've just learned that we can make a much bigger difference if we co-invent and create and, of course, partner with common partners such as Cuyahoga County. So uh, it's, you know, 
Jumpstart doesn't have the expertise that Magnet has, of course. They don't have the expertise that we have uh, in and around early stage investing. So how can one plus one equal five is, you know, we, we have finally figured that out, I would say, at the next level of uh, performance. And uh, as we will all see outcome, we're very excited about the greater outcomes we'll be able to, to uh, realize together. Well, that's great to hear, Ray. Thank you. It's, uh, you know, working in silos never gets us too far and uh, collaborating and bringing ourselves under the same umbrella certainly um, expands all the opportunities. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for the chair? Yeah, you ought to go down there and see it, man. Uh, it's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah. I'd it's love a, it. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a standalone operation, it's a community operation. It has a community park directly associated with it. And uh, they had a reception for the community on kickoff day. So it's, 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 it's pretty exciting uh, out there. Um, Ray, I'm, I'm, you said that in 20, 2030, if I heard the number correctly, you're gonna have uh, raised $4 billion. Correct. Yeah, that's and the what, aspiration. That's the goal that, that the community, that funds in the community, uh, corporations, institutions, and entities like uh, like Jumpstart that we have collectively will have raised four billion. Okay, that's that's not your per uh, per se target of Jumpstart. No, no, Jump yeah. Jumpstart's aspirations through twenty twenty three are uh, originally one hundred and fifty million. As of uh, this morning, we've raised almost a hundred of that, so we might bump it up. But I would expect and hope that Jumpstart. Uh, by 2030, we'll maybe have raised 500 million. Okay. Uh, and what's the status of that 4 billion at this moment in time within our community? So as of the latest number, we were at 800. Oh, okay. um, so we're well on our way. I think one of the most important things, not that the county has a direct role in this, but one of the most important things we are really focused on is how do we get the corporations the medium to large size corporations in our community to kind of double double down in and around innovation and do it in a way that's relevant to our community. Meaning, uh, you know, having the innovation teams, having the spin outs or the acquisitions uh, be acquired by the Cleveland or the principal headquarters in Cuyahoga County. Most large, medium and large size corporations uh, in regions like Pittsburgh, uh, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Detroit have their own local corporations playing a much larger role in the innovation ecosystem locally than we have been able to achieve quite yet. I mean, certainly we have the Cleveland Clinic and others that are very focused, but you know, I think to get to four billion, we're gonna need a handful of our largest corporations uh, to start to play a more meaningful role. So that's a big area of focus of this collective goal. Well, the, in that uh, manufacturing sector partnership you mentioned, as far as Magnet, there are the bigger companies are, are part of that. You do Absolutely. have the Lucasols, you do have the Lincolns, you do have the Nordsons, uh, you do have those, those folks are, who, are, who are the big, big players in town uh, in regards to that. And what the Rule 78 says, your billion is going to double uh, to two billion, and then that only gives you another, uh, what, three years left to run it up to get before your, your, your right. people. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. need to we need to get the number up. Um, and I'm encouraged. Jumpstart's in conversations along with other members of the Cleveland Innovation Project talking to 10 major corporations in town now to try to help them advance their innovation strategies, most of which include a, a funding mechanism. As a quick example, good it's outside our county, but Goodyear announced a $100 million innovation fund last year. So 10 million a year over the next 10 years. Uh, and we're really trying to leverage that as an aspiration for similar size publicly traded companies uh, in the county. The Summit County has their own sector partnership where they're creating a very common solution, I think, to our Cuyahoga County uh, solution out there. Uh, and your sources of funds for that, too, that $4 billion are going to be not only just... Principally will be private. My, my expectation is... Gosh, probably 90% of that will be private investors. Oh, okay. Private meaning corporations that are going to... Corporations, in institutions, endowments, pension funds, 
Um, yeah, it'll be it'll be the private sector writ large. Okay, very good. Uh, any any questions based on the chair's question? Uh, with that, uh, now Paul, how how is this going to be uh, the in innovation going to be incorporated into the five year plan as far as as you see it? Thank you again uh, to the chair. We already indicate in our plan the importance of innovation, and I would simply note that as one of the points of emphasis over the next five year period, we're writing in and specifically referencing the Cleveland Innovation Project because so much of the good work that was done in that area um, impacts how we as a county want to focus our time and attention. But um, it has been part of the plan and the CIP will be a point of emphasis for the next five year cycle. Well, the one addition is what uh, Ray mentioned today. If it's 4 billion in, in 2030, uh, that means that in five years, you're probably at a billion three quarters at least. So we ought to figure out how do we fit in that billion three quarter number that, that Ray put out uh, that should be there by, by year five in order to hit 4 billion by year uh, 2030. All right, All right. Uh, you have a, a third, third presentation yes. then? So uh, actually with the chair's permission, because David Gilbert has a hard stop going to uh, ask uh, David to talk about regional marketing and we will come back to talk about our workforce and employment efforts. So I'd like to ask David to come forward at this time. Sounds great. And David, your hard stop is what time? Just so uh, 10, 10 after, I have to jump on a 4.15, so about 10 after four. Okay, you've got uh, 20 minutes, go for uh, it. Uh, it th thanks uh, and good, good to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of friendly faces on here I haven't seen for a while. Um, <laughs> Um, so, I, 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 as you all know, um, you know, interesting year uh, uh, and tough year related to travel and tourism um, and everything related to it, including marketing. Um, but I, I guess I would I'll, I, I would start by going back just before COVID, mm -hmm. and um, we our community has seen um, an incredible growth. Um, in the number of people visiting Cleveland for leisure travel, business travel, convention travel. In fact, we've had eight straight years where our growth is larger than the national average um, and going from about 13 million visits a year to just under 20 from 2013 until, until uh, 2019. Um, we beat the rest of it. We beat the Ohio average based on the same data seven out of eight years um, and, and everything corresponding to that, the, the spending, the related taxes, jobs, and so on. With that, you know, we, we take a, a very data-driven approach um, in, in, in how we approach this. And one, one of the very important um, aspects is what we know from how people make their decisions on where they choose to spend, where they choose to go and spend their visitor dollar, is is very linked to their perception of a place. Not none of this is rocket science. We have a lot of a lot of data on it, and we also know that Cleveland. And when I say Cleveland, that is the brand we use to the outside world. It doesn't mean the municipality of. Quite frankly, while you know almost everything we concentrate on is within Cuyahoga County, but we do work with the Football Hall of Fame and and with wine, you know, wine country and jog in Ashtabula County and and Cedar Point, because when we're drawing people from two, three, four, five states away, they're gonna if, if someone goes to Cedar Point, there's a good chance they're gonna be spending their dollar here. We want to get them here, and and to all of them, they know Cleveland. They don't know. So just I just think important to point that out. And, and um, what we know is that um, we've had a lot of data of how the perception of Cleveland has changed and changed for the better. Uh, uh, and we've had a lot of problems with that locally, regionally, nationally, and, and even within those demographics that are most important to us in this, particularly millennials or really under 34 who tend to um, uh, um, travel here, are most open to travel here and, and spend a higher percentage of their dollars on travel and experiences. Well, obviously COVID put a halt on basically the entire industry, but thankfully it was, I would say it was enterprise wide. This wasn't a Cleveland problem. This was a any city in the world problem. And, and we actually think that 
coming out of this, we're very well positioned if we do it smart and well to grow even faster. But what we're, what we, something we, uh, um, more relevant to, to what we're discussing today was the, the research that also shows that, that people who visit here are far more open to the message of Cleveland as a place to live, as a place to invest, as a place to go to college, as a place to even retire. And in all the research uh, uh, that we've started to do on how people make their decisions on where to move, um, and how they view Cleveland as a place for what we always term is how do we take our, our, uh, our, our dates that we get with visiting and turn them into long-term relationships. And, and what we know is that um, we can have all the matches of jobs that we want. We can have all the opportunity for people. We can have low cost of living. But if they're not open to the message of Cleveland as a place to live, if they're not willing to consider us from the very beginning, none of those matter. They're still not coming here. And, and a lot of the research we've now done, and we, we, we did prior to and during COVID, um, showed that we still have, a, we, we do have a long, long way to go. Um, we well over index, not a surprise, on people outside of Cleveland who would not even consider us as a place to live and work, even if the job matches, salary matches, everything else. Mm -hmm. but, but thankfully, there's a huge portion that are, are, you know, you really have three buckets, those that are open to it, those that are close to it, and those that might consider. And that number in between is pretty good for Cleveland. What we also know is that when people visit here, uh, when people have a, any kind of former relationship with our community, their openness to Cleveland as a place to live and work goes up significantly. So uh, uh, we've done a lot of work. Um, uh, 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 we started some work prior to COVID. A lot of it got put on hold, in particular the last six months or so. We've done a lot of work in concert with GCP, with, uh, um, with Team NEO, um, Paul has been a, a, a part of these discussions and, and several other nonprofit organizations on the development of a, a live work ecosystem. What we know is it, to, to get people to, to do it right, to get people to live and work here is not the purview of any one entity. There's so much that's involved in attraction and retention of people. It takes a lot of entities that bring a lot of peace to the table. What Destination Cleveland's piece is, is really the, the lead in um, in the attraction piece, in, in, in working on target and having the right brand, the right messaging, and the, the right critical strategies to get people to be open to the message of living and working in Cleveland and getting them into that funnel of consideration. Once they are, we're not the keepers of what jobs might be available. There's a lot of other pieces to this. And when you get people here, who are the ones that interact with them to get them to most stay here? Groups like um, uh, Cleveland Leadership Center and, and, um, uh, and others, Engage Cleveland and so on. And so we, we, we are in the process now of completing a, a calling a brand evolution. We've done a lot of research um, on the perception of Cleveland in other markets uh, and hiring some national experts to do research on, um, again, nas national overall research on how people consider communities a place to live and work, particularly now with COVID and a more transient workforce and where our community in particular plays a role. And what we do know is we have to, we have to be smart about it. Us just deciding to uh, take out some ads in Silicon Valley because people are looking for a cheaper place to live isn't exactly the way to do it because what research shows is a majority of them won't even consider Cleveland. So we have to look at who are the groups that will consider Cleveland the most. It is people who visited here and we're working on an entire new strategy related data to capture that. Um, it's Cleveland expats, people who have, who, who have lived here or worked here and know Cleveland. Um, it's, it's people who are in college in Northeast Ohio that have, that are already testing the product, if you will. And what, what it's important to understand is us on this call, we're not the audience. We live here. We love Cleveland. We, I mean, I, I, you know, if you, if you, we now actually over index on locals. And if you ask locals, would they recommend Cleveland as a place to live to their friends and family? 
We over index more than the nation. People who are here love it and we need to take advantage of that. But those outside of Cleveland that still have a perception that needs to be improved, um, uh, um, they're it basically, we, we need we, to be the smartest about, we need to fish where the fish are. And those are people who, and there are tens and tens of millions of those. So what we're doing is we're, we're um, working on finalizing really an ecosystem that, that uh, um, would, would, you know, where our role will be how to attract and market pe to, to people and get them in the funnel of consideration. From there, who do we pass it off to? What industries are we passing it off to? Um, who is going to provide them that information? Who is going to interact with those folks? And that's why I'm really excited that we're doing this with other groups because to do it right, it's not, it's not just Destination Cleveland. It's not just Greater Cleveland Partnership or Team Neo or, or any of the organizations. We have to work like this. And, and I think I will tell you for the first time in uh, many, many years, um, I'm seeing some, some uh, uh, strong relationships in those areas that are kind of putting ego aside and, and everybody saying, we know we have a impo an important role to play and we need to do what we do best alongside with others and what they do best. And, and the, the end of the day, we can, we can have metrics that we can all be proud of and they don't have to, it's, it's not about propping up any one organization or another. So I would say there is more to come over the next several months, but we've had amazing progress over the past really four to six months and, and feel like we are, we are really, uh, um, uh, and I guess the last thing I'll say, I, I think we feel like we, we can develop um, a, an ecosystem and set of programs here um, that the state may have, a, and we've had Jobs Ohio in several of our meetings, I think may have a, a real interest in helping to fund and potentially using, using it as a pilot for other cities around the state. Whether they can pull it off or not, don't know. A lot of ways don't care as much. Um, uh, uh, you know, this is for us is about Cleveland and, uh, uh, and how we get more people here and, get, and, and with that get people here that, that for some groups fill certain types of positions that we, we most need to fill. So I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, um, Jack and just open up for any any thoughts questions. Okay, sounds great. Questions from anybody uh, on the committee? Well, I have a question, Chair, if sure. I may. Sure, go ahead, Ms. Baker. Um, thanks, uh, I guess I just a little clarity on um, on your role in trying to bring people here and the hard work of uh, events. And um, you know all the things that we try to lift Cleveland to show what a place it is so that when they come they see what a great town it is and as you said may want to stay, um, may give it a chance, may think that they can move their family here. But um, so are you um, shifting a bit in what it is that you do in um, thinking more about uh, bringing people here to to live and work? Or um, is it more of, you know, all the things that I know we've had in the past years before the pandemic of uh, bringing people here for events and, you know, all, all that uh, you did? And it, it's, a, it's a great question. I appreciate it. Something we, we've talked about a lot internally and, and struggled with a little bit. You know, at the end of the day, our, our primary mission does not change. In our minds, if we don't continue to grow the number of people who visit here, um, we're going to have failed. Right. And and um, uh, um, it, it we we've been starting to use the term leverage the power of the visitor. Mm -hmm. And and part you know what we've really what we've realized is so we have these twenty million visits a year. They're not all unique, but it, we we show there's six to eight million unique unique visitors a year. Some of them will come two or three times. And and um, and our job, we, what we feel that we can do, if, if we is have the opportunity to, to um, get them interested in a longer term relationship with our community. And so it is, I would say we are slightly widening our lanes, but we are not, um, uh, we are not in, in any way, shape or form abandoning um, what we do to attract people here. In fact, I'll give you one good example. During, during the draft, 
um, we did a pilot project. So it's interesting, you know, the Sports Commission is a totally separate entity. Sports Commission um, got the draft here and ran it, ran it, managed it, raised all the money, did everything we need to do to have it here. Sports Commission doesn't market Cleveland. Its role isn't destination marketing. So what Destination Cleveland stepped in to do was it ran a, it, it helped a, a market to get more people to come in for the draft, but we ran a pilot and we actually did it uh, with, uh, with Engage Cleveland and Team Neo were in the mix. And we, um, we, we knew who, who bought tickets for the draft through the NFL. And we sent them information on Cleveland as a place to live and work. And there's, there, I'm simplifying it, but we actually captured um, like 1800 names of people who now want information of Cleveland as a place to live and work just from that one event. And, and, you know, this isn't about hits. This is about people who opted in to get information and are interested. That was a big number from one event. And so I think, I think that, that we need to use the visitors and the events and those opportunities as a tool. And, mm -hmm. and, and then we need to leverage those to, um, uh, uh, to know who these people are uh, and, and, um, and get information to them uh, and start marketing to them not just to be a repeat visitor, but, but considering living and working here. If I may follow, Chair. Sure. That's, um, that's, that's remarkable, really. I understand the, the, the leveraging of trying to, as long as when we have them here, let's take advantage of who they are and what their interests are, and if they would consider being here. When you uh, promote Cleveland as a place to live and work, do you promote all of the outskirts of Cleveland too, showing what a great place maybe Shaker Heights is to live or great place maybe that Bay Village is and maybe somewhere in a community near the lakes. I mean, how broad are you in um, selling our area here, especially in Cuyahoga County um, beyond the city of Cleveland? Um, we, we, it is absolutely countywide. And that's part of what we're working on. We're, we're, we're in this ecosystem. What are the partners that are going to provide all, you know, we don't have all the information on Shaker Heights and Rocky River and Bay Village, but who do we bring the table that if we, when we create the platform, they can put in all that information. I'm, you are so dead. I mean, that's why I go back to Cleveland is the outside brand. We don't represent the municipality of Cleveland. We represent this region. And look, it's, it's largely primarily Cuyahoga County. And, and you know, it, it has to be all of the school systems, all of, all of the, um, the suburb. I mean, it, part of what we have to show is it, we, have, we have incredible depth here in what we can offer and incredible diversity in what we can offer. Mm -hmm. and, and some of that is you know, uh, um, neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland, and some of those are are further out suburbs in Cuyahoga County. But but that's that's uh, um, you know we 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 have to get them interested in what what they 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 believe Cleveland is, and and what that brand is, and then present to them this full slate of information. And that's part of what we're to, again getting back working on now is who's the best to input and provide provide that information, but promise you it is, it is not just Cleveland proper at all. Okay, that's, that's good to know because we are such a diverse um, region. I mean, wow, you can really have many different areas of, of quality of life in, a, in totally different environments that yeah, uh, whether absolutely. it's pools or whether it's near parks or whether it's near the lake or um, just, I just, but I, I wasn't sure if that was part of your promotion once you realize there are people that are interested in coming to Cleveland. Um, Very much so. One thing I like, like, if you go on our website now for visitors, we have an entire section that, that we, we built about five years ago. Uh, and we, we have every suburb and we, we allow each suburb in Cuyahoga County to go on and to, um, uh, uh, to input all their own information. So they can speak to what they, South Euclid can go on and speak to what they want to sell most about South Euclid and on and on. So we don't pretend to know all of it, um, but we allow that platform to let every Cuyahoga County suburb do that on their own. Great. Okay. Are there I other, think a very similar approach. Other questions, I'd be conscious of your five more minutes you have left with us. So 
or Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you go hold on, Mr. Miller, I'll just let other committee members first. Is there any other committee members? Uh, seeing none. Okay, Mr. Miller. So uh, we know that there's difficulty in recruiting people into the service and hospitality industries. My question is, how do we overcome that? And do you see that as a temporary situation or more ongoing? You know, Dale, it's a, it's, it's a very good question. If you ask people in the industry, and obviously your question, you probably know, it is the number one issue right now. It's amazing how many places want to be open and can't be that they, they're, they're closed certain days a week or they can only have certain tables open because they can't find the help. Mm -hmm. I, in talking to a lot of people in the industry, I think the, the consensus seems to be it is temporary. It's, it's difficult, but temporary. And, and, um, and, and I think a lot of people's hope is that by the end of the year, it will normalize. It may mean that, you know, right now, you know, I've heard, you know, line cooks that might normally make $14 an hour place are paying them $20 an hour um, because that's what they need right now. They don't know if that's sustainable for their business model. But I, I feel like, you know, this is a, a, an issue all over the country in this industry. And, um, and uh, uh, I, I think it will, it will, it will absolutely normalize um, in part when, when, a lot of um, the the unemployment benefits run out, and people uh, um, are getting back to to having to work. But I also think it could end up meaning overall some higher wages in the industry across the board. Now, some of that may be passed on to consumers and a little bit higher prices. Um, but but I think when I've talked to a lot of people in the industry, um, I, I think people really hope that by the end of the year, it. It, the, the industry has kind of found its equilibrium from a job standpoint, but big issue now. Okay, I don't think you have much more time, so I'm going to let it go with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, just only real quick, because I know I got two minutes. Uh, you said you had 1,800 people on your list. Uh, knowing that uh, uh, big tech is uh, uh -oh, sometimes you get a bad rap, uh, this would be one place where we could maybe get a good rap. Do we know the demographics of any of these people? Do we know? whether they came for a medical reason uh, to the uh, uh, draft or whether they, did they have a manufacturing background or they have an IT background so we could actually go out and target them back to Paul's sector, pre sector partnerships that we're launching because they all need help. Uh, they so, all need work. Jack, right now we, we don't, but that's kind of our, our, we did that because the draft was here and, and it would, you know, we, 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 you know, we're, we're still, I mean, to your point, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the different metrics, particularly related to industry clusters. And, and so we are, we are getting there. The, the, you know, I, I think there's a balance between overall population growth, but also growth in filling jobs in particular, uh, um, uh, um, I guess, sectors of, of most interest here. I mean, it, you know, the ones that, that Ray had talked about with the Cleveland Innovation Project are healthcare, Advanced manufacturing and and IT. Um, th those are three that that are are where there's strong industry clusters and uh, um, uh, and you know it it th those will absolutely be a key to the plan. I suggest you turn those 1,800 names back to those three sectors and let them try and work those leads the same way you're work, going to work a lead to see whether you get any of them here. Part part of it is, and I I, I do have to run. We, yep, we want to do it in a really systematic way. So everybody is speaking. We're, we're all everybody is speaking to the groups, particularly about about um, the messages of living in Cleveland, um, and again, Cleveland not being municipality of in in the same way, the same voice, the same. So that's part of what we're trying to resist. So, but it, bye bye. I, Thank hey, you. you have one minute. Welcome anybody reaching out on more thoughts and questions. Thanks Thank everybody. You. Keep up the good work. Thanks, David. Thank you. Uh, last, last but not least, uh, Paul. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I do want to assure the committee, I'm going to make sure we have time, you know, additional discussion. We do have a list of about eight points of emphasis, which I'll go over where we're adjusting the plan. So we will make sure there's time for that questions, discussion from the committee on those points as well. Uh, but I do want to give um, some time to my colleague, Frank Brickner. Frank is the director of the Ohio Means Jobs Office here. And over the past year, we've had an extraordinary situation, of course, 
Who would have thought we'd see unemployment rates in the mid 20s in our lifetime, and yet we did. Um, so we've had a lot of short-term work to do. I will, I will say though, that in the midst of this short-term work, we have not lost sight of our long-term objective, which is to really work on the workforce issue. Because as I talk to Team Neo, as I talk to Great Student Partnership, as I talk directly to corporations who we're trying to attract here to Cleveland or to induce them to grow here, the number one issue that comes up, it is not money, it is not taxes, it is not even, is there an available land or building? It is workforce. If I bring this operation here, will I be able to find the employees to do the work that needs to be done? And so going forward, while we will not lose sight of our deals, our sites, any other parts of this work, if we don't focus on workforce, if we don't focus on filling the talent gap, we are going to fall farther and farther behind in the race to attract and grow our businesses. So that being said, um, you know, Frank's gonna talk a little bit about work over the last year and also about some of the work we're doing together with our three sector partnerships. So Frank. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, committee. Um, yet Ohio means jobs, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County. We wanna be seen as a key player in helping build the talent pipeline for where the good jobs are. So over this past year, we really developed stronger relationships with the sector intermediaries. We really wanted to emphasize career training to get the skills to where the good occupations were. And that did pro produce some good dividends over this past year. Um, we're funded on a July to June cycle and we have provided paid occupational skills training to over 500 adults. We owe eligible adults this current fiscal year well, in healthcare, manufacturing, and IT. The pre, that's more than the previous two fiscal years together. So we're really trying to promote career training in CNC, um, LPN, um, and the various other um, areas, software coders. So that really grew significantly. Overall, we trained close to 800 this past year. So the majority are in those career sectors. We worked with Magnet a lot. That was the first sector intermediary. And they came to us saying, hey, we have an employer design curriculum. The manufacturers want, if individuals go through this, that emphasizes some um, soft skills, as well as some manufacturing skills, we will hire folks. So we worked with Magnet and Towards Employment, Towards Employment's running the curriculum, and together we got the state of Ohio to approve it. It's a big deal because now that's approved, we can send any we owe eligible individual in and pay for that training. We've funded a couple cohorts of folks from reentry and young adults. And so far, you know, the results are pretty good. You know, 52 reentry folks have gone through, 39 have completed, 13 just recently, and 29 uh, have found employment. Three or four others didn't find employment because they decide to go on for further training, which is a good thing. So we're very optimistic that we have a model that the employers like, and we want to continue to fund the be the funnel to get individuals into that train where good jobs are. Um, healthcare, we're, we're really excited that I think in the next month we're going to announce an initiative that hopefully County Council will approve or Board of Control, where we will have a contract with the sector intermediary, Tri-C. Tri-C has worked with the hospital system, Metro, Cleveland Clinic, UH, and they came together and said, look, if we could get through like a healthcare boot camp, you know, we're emphasizing some of the soft skills, some of the information about healthcare careers, we will hire them in, in various critical areas uh, that we need, you know, patient care, sterile processing, and all that. So we're excited. We will fund that training with our federal workforce dollars. And we're hopeful that over the next year, 100 individuals will find careers. 
hey, if we're successful th with this, we want to grow the magnet model and the Tri-C model to get more people in. And then what's exciting about this initiative is when someone gets hired, they'll have like a mentor attached to them to help them, you know, along the way and be there. Because a lot of times individuals, you know, may their ter employment may terminate, something may disrupt that we want to be there to assist them if there's any issues. We're also working with the IT sector, um, the, the right board under the GCP, and we're hoping to be able to do something there. Another initiative, and we're really happy to jump on board, is when Jobs Ohio announced the Ohio to Work initiative and wanted to pilot it in Cuyahoga County. And we were asked, are you interested? I, I'd be like, sure, you know, we're, we're totally you know, on board with this. This is an initiative that really amplifies what we do. And through their efforts, you know, working with some of the IT schools, we filled some cohorts at Tech Elevator. We could go to, to get more software developers, maybe with, you know, not their typical, you know, um, student, but more emphasizing black, brown, you know, and that. So trying to get more individuals interested in it with employers on the back end to, to hire. And we're doing the same thing with this initiative in healthcare careers, could be at Tri-C, Cuyahoga Valley Career Center, and manufacturing also. So I think it got more individuals into our doors to help um, get into training programs and Jobs Ohio, he had some financing that was available above and beyond what our WIOA grants could pay for. Um, the other thing is it allowed us, our career coaches, to get some assessment tools to really help with our dialogue with an individual coming to us. So we know more about them. What are their interests? What are their skills? Maybe they're not so familiar with some of the careers out there in manufacturing, healthcare, and IT. And we can help frame that discussion and say, hey, you have these skills, but maybe it'll translate better into this. So from my perspective, it's been a win-win working with Jobs Ohio and being a pilot site because now we have more tools to allow us to know more about the individual. And we've been able to fund more career training, which I think is very important. Going forward, one of our challenges will be uh, while we're training more people, that's a great thing. We got to bring more people into our doors. Our volume was cut in half this past year because of the pandemic. We were serving people virtually. We we're promoting it in that. But with our doors being closed so much, you know, we lost. But, you know, typically we may have 4,000 people coming at our doors. That was half that. You know, we have over 2,000 job placements. It was half that. So we are really full press on getting more individuals to know about us, being able to be like hybrid models, open here at 1910, being out in the community more, and then being able to serve people virtually. So they all will be a full court press this year. We have a good relationship with um, Paul's department as well as Kevin Gowan's department, how we can collaborate, work together. You know, our business team that we contract, how do we market skill up? And, and, and his team can market our programs also. As you're aware, we jointly fund CCMAP with um, TANF. So, you know, those are initial, you know, to work together, smarter, collaborate, to make it easier on our employers and job seekers going forward, to, but to also be seen as, hey, Ohio means jobs can get me the talent they need. They know how to work with someone coming in the doors to really do good career coaching, to lead them to the right career. And I'll open it up for any questions you may have. Questions from the committee. I'll have a question, Chair. Sure. Ms. Baker. So, um, thank you for that overview of what, what you've been doing. I know it's been a challenging year. And um, going back to 2019 with your 4,000 coming through your door, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, uh, what barriers do you see when someone comes in and they're desperate for a job and they haven't been able to find one and they walk into Ohio means jobs and 
says, I'll do anything, give me training, mm -hmm. uh, set me up, analyze what my skills are. What, what would you say your success rate is for that person? And what is mostly the barrier that stops them from? Sure. You know, um, I will say that in the past, when we register someone into WIOA, at least three quarters of them end up getting employed. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, sometimes you just hang on to them until they're employed and continue to work with them. But, you know, here are the barriers. Um, you know, reading and writing and comprehension and math. I mean, a lot of times individuals, even if they want career training, they can't even get into the school. They can't get into Tech Elevator because they're you know, uh, scores are too low. Um, we have a spire on um, site here. What is a spire? It's the Cuyahoga Library. They get money, federal money also to help increase someone's reading, writing, math skills, and they have to, um, help with GED also. You know, so we have referrals in place. The other thing is too often, you know, what the number one area people want to get trained in is CDL, being the truck driver, because in four to six weeks, they can get their license and have a job. But that's a churning industry. No one likes being over the road and all that, you know, because it's easy to get into. If you have conversations with individuals like, oh, maybe you'll be a good candidate for CNC operator or an LPN, that may be six to nine months. And a lot of individuals say, I don't have that time to get the skills. I need money quicker and that. So there's a sense of urgency among people we're finding. And we're finding that a lot of people are not even qualifying to get into some of these programs at Tri-C, other organizations, because their sco scores are too low as they come in. Right. If I may follow with that, Chair. Sure. Um, thank you for that. And, and you know, that is that is the challenge. So for those that uh, need those, I guess we can call them academic soft skills, mm -hmm. reading, writing, comprehension, to be able to, to take the entry level tests that perhaps it may take to get the job they're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, how successful are you? I mean, and how, how big of a group is that? Is that half of who you talk to or 25%, how, how big of a challenge are we facing? You know, I would have to be estimating with these numbers, but I would say that at least one in three, as you see coming in our doors, are not qualifying for training. Did you say one in 30? One in three who want oh. career training are not qualifying for it. They are That's significant. Yes. And then, you know, in a lot of cases, are they taking that more, not a career, but a dead end? I mean, you can have conversations with them to say, hey, we can put you in these classes on site here or, you know, at Aspire, but it takes two to tango. They have to be willing to do it. In a lot of cases, it, they don't have the time. So, it, you know, we're, we're always looking for more innovative solutions and that, um, so, some of our career training programs are not as um, rigid, I think, taking in, you know, people. It depends on where the training is. Um, I mentioned the manufacturing access program. That's not as rigid to get in as being a software coder or that. But Thank you. And I think that's, I just think we need to recognize that as your challenge of those that are the hardest to employ, right. need employment so that they can care for their families, their children, and have something to um, have a quality of life. And, mm -hmm. and to overcome that one out of three, which is mm -hmm. pretty high, uh, we need to give more thought to that, I think. Right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. First, to follow up on, on Ms. Baker's line of inquiry. Are you seeing very many people who, uh, who do the CDL, go through the train and get the license and, uh, and work as a truck driver for a while, save up some money and, uh, so that they, uh, they have enough money in the bank that, the, that then they can go for, uh, for a longer 
a six month to a year program and and uh, and and get another job whether or not on the road all the time. Yeah. Well, part of our challenge here is, you know, if you get your CDL and you're working, then most likely you're not income eligible for our federal grant, which he has eligibility requirements. That's a challenge, you know, quite honestly, because as soon as they're working and they're doing pretty well on their own, we're, we're to exit them. So, you know, we, we have looked at, you know, um, truck drive, and I don't want to say anything that, that pays very well. And for a lot of people, it's right, but it's a churning industry as people, you know, there's good, a significant amount don't stay more than a year. They'll find things, maybe if they quit their job now, magically, then they're eligible again, because they don't have the income. Um, but I don't think we get a lot of that. They may find other employment on their own. And uh, my other question is whether a formal program has been put together that takes people who are not currently uh, qualified in terms of, of academic and other skills to, uh, to go into a training program that, uh, that specifically takes them to the necessary level and hopefully does so relatively quickly. That's why I'm really excited about our sector um, initiatives working with the sector intermediaries. You know, that with Tri-C, you know, you have a commitment from the hospitals to hire 100 people from our system, you know, and these are people in the neighborhoods who are, you know, but then it's not only just to get them in the door, but also how, when they're at Cleveland Clinic, how can they advance and succeed at Cleveland Clinic? So there's, it's not rigid to get in there. They want, if you're successful in going through the boot camp and learning about the careers and that, you'll be hired. Same with the manufacturing access program I spoke about earlier. If you're successful going through the um, initial training and getting, you know, the soft skills training, employers are committed to hiring you. So those are a couple examples. Um, where I think we're getting people in the door with good jobs, getting training. Right now, there's uh, there's just a whole lot of demand for for employees. Yeah. Uh, uh, it seems that that anybody who has some ability and makes a reasonable effort is is able to to get work and probably to advance. Uh, yes. Do you see that as uh, as a long term sustainable situation, or do you think that's kind of a temporary post post COVID environment, and and that the job market's going to get more competitive for for the uh, employee side? You, you know, who knows? That's that's a great question. You know. I, I would think that, you know, as we emerge from COVID and, you know, maybe individuals have lose the extra unemployment, maybe there's a sense of urgency as daycares more open up, as schools are open and mom or dad doesn't have to stay home, you know, that there's going to be more demand for these positions. So you would think, you know, hopefully, you know, this is short short-term crisis that we will have more people coming and out looking for jobs, filling those positions. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Other questions for anybody on the committee? Uh, just one comment. I think, Mr. Mr. Brichter, you, you indicated about the access program and uh, the folks coming out of formerly incarcerated it's my understanding there was not one day of recidivism out of that entire uh, cadre you're talking about. Is that, that's the, what I had heard. That, that was the last I had heard, but that news was about a month old. So I'll have to follow up on that. But that's an exceptional, unbelievable story yeah. that not one single day of any of those formerly incarcerated individuals out of the 52 uh, went, went back into an institution. So that's, Mm -hmm. It speaks well of both the desire to want to learn and the desire to uh, uh, to employ uh, out there. So it's a win-win for out there. And my understanding is that the governor 
has also got uh, put forth an expedited parole program that says that at 10 years, your entire record is expunged. Uh, and uh, uh, I had a conversation in another part-time job I have uh, where um, I suggested why wait 10 years? Mm -hmm. Why not do it in five years? If you could come into an employer and the employer holds a golden ticket like they did in Willy Wonka and says at five years, your record gets expunged. If you stay and work and work hard, uh, it's a win for everybody. Mm -hmm. Society wins, the individual wins, the, the business wins, whether it's hospitality, IT, medical, uh, manufacturing. I just cannot help but that would be a way to accelerate it for everybody out there to, to show. Um, uh, and if, if, if I was you, I would highly suggest it to your folks and the friends that you've got. Yep. Ohio means jobs. Why not? Why not take his, what I think is a great program of a 10 year expunge and move it to some magical number lower than that. Right. If the person can demonstrate a work and, a, and they've worked uh, continuously for five years, what a, what a win-win for everybody. I totally agree with that comment. You're right on. And the good the benefit for employers is, you know, a lot of employers are hesitant to hire anybody with a record, as you know. But, you know, when you're hearing from employers who will hit, hear, hire reentry, they say they're some of the most dedicated, um, loyal employees they have. Yeah, you know, so I totally support your comment. It'd be great that go down. When, when, this, when this ends, I'll send you a link to a program that was... Uh, National Association of Manufacturers is one of these 52 individuals, uh, mm -hmm. Corey, uh, and, and you will see the smile on his face and the success that he's had. Great. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Not hearing any. Uh, Paul, the court's back to you. Yes, to the chair. So I'm going to briefly share my screen once more, uh, just as I run over some of the key adjustments we're making uh, as we tune up the five-year plan. We did not want to make any drastic changes, uh, again, because the past year has been so unusual. Um, and we really also think that we're on the right track with many of our strategies. But I did want to highlight for the committee several areas where adjustments were made. Um, the first one was mentioning even more prominently the fact that we will continue to promote our fresh water. In other words, we have a great lake right on northern border. And not only is the water useful for manufacturing, but we also believe that our proximity to the lake makes us a logical place to have companies working in water technology. So we are working with the Cleveland Water Alliance, which is housed at the Greater Cleveland Partnership, on both a marketing campaign and a specifically targeted outreach campaign to industry leaders that our research shows may be amenable to bringing operations here because the water is here. And we will continue that work. In the area of microgrids, I know that uh, the committee of the whole has had a number of hearings. So I will not uh, you know, belabor the point except to say that strategically, we believe the ability to establish the public utility to offer the microgrid alternative for reliable electric service will be a positive driver for economic growth in our county. We will continue to work on that. In terms of lakefront, asset, lakefront access, as the executive has announced and have, we've begun to devote resources, the lake shore of Lake Erie to our north is one that can be made more accessible to the public. Our example, Councilwoman Simon is here. The city of Euclid has so successfully transformed a section of its lakefront into a public promenade, which is linked to some revenue generating businesses. And we will continue to promote this access to the lake as a key asset, asset of our region. Just last week, um, we marked the opening of the Wendy Park Bridge. Um, I'm an old county hand. I was here at the time when Cuyahoga County was active in securing that land. And now we've made it available to the trail network so people can actually reach the lake in that area. We will continue to, to work with our municipal partners in this regard. In terms of major cultural assets, this past year has been very challenging for our cultural organizations. We were able to provide some CARES Act funding to help some of them. Um, we continue to support Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. And I would only note that we include among our assets the professional sports teams 
and we will continue to make it a priority to support and retain our professional sports teams as well. In terms of equity commitment, substantial work has been done by this council and the administration to advance equity. And I will only note that we will continue to strengthen the fact that our economic development plan is also a plan for equity. As just one example, when we provide resources for organizations to support small businesses, we do not say serve minority businesses only, that would be wrong, but we do say be sure you have a program to determine the needs of minority-owned businesses, which in many cases are still feeling the impacts of unequal access to wealth over generations, so that minority-owned businesses do need additional help and support. We will continue to make that part of our program, and we will be conscious of that going forward. We consciously report on participation of people um, of color in our programs, both as owners and as employees. And we believe that that reporting helps us understand if we're doing enough and need to adjust if we're not. Um, one aspect of this is equity zones. The executive will soon be announcing an executive order which recognizes certain parts of the county have been historically burdened by um, housing discrimination in the past on other actions such as perhaps the building of freeways that um, destroyed some neighborhoods. So when we consider allocating our public works resources and to some extent our economic development resources, we will be mindful of the fact that some areas which will be designated as equity zones are areas where additional help is needed and we will work to provide that help as it's needed. Um, another aspect of equity is closing the digital divide. Um, we have an innovation chief, Catherine Tkachuk, who's been very active in working to bring resources in so we can achieve the goal of affordable broadband access for every county resident. We've done some work through our libraries. We recently made an announcement in East Cleveland, working with Microsoft. We're working very closely with the city of Cleveland, which is also working in this area. And one thing I will note is it is requiring some advocacy because even though the federal rescue plan included money for broadband, it was written in such a way that it's challenging to use for the affordability problem. Tendency to think about this problem only in terms of rural areas where the wires simply don't exist, but it's equally, equally a problem for a resident of Cuyahoga County if the wires are right there at the street, but they can't afford the $60 a month um, market rate for internet broadband access. So we're attempting to focus not only on the physical access, but the ability of broadband for every resident. In the area of innovation, we've already heard substantial uh, uh, discussion earlier today, and we'll simply indicate that we continue to um, take advantage of the fact that our resources leverage many times over state resources from the third frontier, and that um, one aspect I will additionally mention here is that we continue to try to work so that when companies are started here, they will also grow here. So it is wonderful to support startup companies. It is very important to work with assets such as NASA to, um, to support innovation, but we also have a responsibility to understand the, the conditions that make it possible and attractive for these innovators to grow their companies right here in the county. And the final thing I will note, um, as we do note in the plan, is we note the strategic importance of wisely using the American Rescue Plan funds. These funds, unlike the CARES Act, can be used over four years. And actually, um, based on the way the legislation is written, if you make commitments in four years, that can be spent over five. So this is really a strategic asset. It matches the planning period of our plan. And as the executive has announced in other areas, and has briefed uh, our staff at Brief Council. We're proceeding in a thoughtful way, deliberate way. We are taking into account, you know, the, the budget situation and some immediate needs. But we are also working to understand how these one-time funds can be strategically deployed to advance the goals of our economic development plan. These are the main areas of change in emphasis. And at this point, I will pause, um, you know, to entertain questions from the chair or the committee about any of the changes to the plan or anything we've discussed to this point, Jack. So Mr. Chair. Sure, so we've, I'm sorry, you know, I'll be brief. I know we've been in this meeting a long time and 
I have a question and I've been asking it about part of this plan and to um, cite an incentive for companies to move here due to our freshwater lake for, for economic development. What exactly are people thinking? I mean, what, what's the attraction to use our fresh water for production? What, what exactly is the connection? Or, you know, I'd like to know what that is. Obviously, you know, water is a shortage. We're going through an extreme drought right now out West, record heat today, 116 in the Pacific Northwest. We've been talking about climate. That's why we need the grid to get off the electrical grid. But what are we doing with water? I mean, we're not selling it, are we? Or we're, we're not suggesting we're gonna have manufacturing be on our lakefront. What, what exactly are you thinking? Thank, thank you, Councilman. Um, first, to be clear, no, this is not a plan to sell the water of Lake Erie to other states. I know that was discussed some time ago. Um, very specifically, there are two ways in which our water resource, our lake, makes this an attractive place for businesses to come and grow. The first is the use of the water itself through our Cleveland Water Department, which brings the water to the industry. The industry does not have to be located on the lakeshore. The Water Department can get it to them. But we have reliable supplies of water, which many regions of the country lack. Um, the Southwest is going through another drought cycle. I know. The Southwest has huge economic distortions. Um, very briefly stated, they've made poor choices in how they use their water. They use far too much of it in agriculture. That's not our problem, but um, it can be to our advantage because industry, which is not able to secure the supplies of water, um, will value and has told the staff at Greater Cleveland Partnership and calls that they do value access to the supplies of water. The challenge at this point is to translate that into specific wins. There's an active calling campaign going on now using some of the, the best business staff at the Greater Cleveland Partnership, led by Brian Stubbs, who's there. And one of the um, things we're working on is targeting the correct industry figures who actually are the decision makers when it comes to locating additional plants so that um, when they look to grow their production, we can say, great, we have this for you here. But that part of it is based on bringing the lake water through Cleveland Water to the industrial site where the plant is located. The second part of this is the fact that there's a whole industry cluster around water technology which naturally aligns itself to places where there is water. But this has to do with water purification, water filtration, water quality maintenance, and to some extent um, with the issue of treatment of wastewater. I would love to arrange a more detailed briefing by Brian Stubbs, who does this for a living all day, every day. But I will tell you that when you look around the country, when you look at the situations that other states find themselves in, we are one of the few parts of the country that does not face any sort of prospect of having a shortage of water over the next five to 10 years. And that is a big part of our fight. Yeah, that, thank you. Go yeah, with that being a topic of, of Ms. Simon, why don't we uh, bring that up for a specific one day activity within economic development and, and lay out the scope of what that is? Because I think there's, there's some expectation that uh, when you hear that it's, I mean, Arsenal Middle obviously used a lot of water and it goes back into the lake and it's very, very, uh, my understanding, it's very, very clean by the time it goes back <laughs> after Arsenal Middle does it. Well, it, yeah, I know. No, I just, you've been there. No, I've been I there. like your qualifier. No, that's all. I liked your qualifier because you said, as, as I understand, no, I believe you. It was just, yeah, as best I mean, we can do. It's as best right, we it, can do. Yeah, we'll have a meeting. That would be great. I think it would be a good idea to, to if that's a, one of the focus topics, Paul, mm -hmm. uh, to have that be a focus area around ED. Uh, and we clearly, was one of the topics that we heard uh, from Ray Leach as false as also uh, when he brought it up from Jumpstart. So it seems to me we ought to let's let's bring it up and, and talk about it in depth as far as how is it a tool that Jumpstart sees it as a tool? Mm -hmm. How is it a tool that uh, the Cleveland Innovation Project saw it as a specific area for a tool and uh, why you're saying it here? So uh, I think that thanks. We all have expectations. What does that mean when you use our lake water? I mean, let's let's. Uh, the, the, the folks in the Colorado River at one end know that what it looks like coming out the other end is to who, who's drawing off all that water. By the time it gets out over to the ocean, it's there's very little left out there. Uh, so this, uh, uh, I'm sure that they they tell you you have an abundance of water at the beginning of the Colorado. By the end of it, it's it's getting a little bit less. 
So uh, if everybody's comfortable with that, let's let's focus on that maybe being an August meeting or September where we actually will do an in-depth two hours, nothing but water. Is that, is that, uh, that sounds great. And then, um, and then in environment sustainability, we'll have two hours on probably from an environmental standpoint. So yeah, I mean, at some point we'll have to merge these two, but yeah, that would be fine. It's a big yeah. issue. I mean, it, it's really important that we don't do what everybody else did out West and divert water and end up in the position we're in now. So this isn't getting better. Um, right. Anytime. It, it's not going to get better. Yeah. We, we don't, of course, the Cuyahoga County doesn't have the luxury of saying that's our water. Uh, that's the lake's water. They don't, that Canada, Michigan, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, all touch that, uh, the same great lake that we all touch as far as Lake Erie. Um, I know, but, yeah. but we're, we're, we're in a position to, you know, to, to impact it. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand how, as are everywhere. Okay. I mean, there was like, like I think Paul mentioned, some group at one point wanted to take it and sell it to California. I thought it was, I don't remember yep. who it was. No, I don't think there's anybody on this call would, would be in favor of that idea. And uh, is recreational use part of uh, your overall oh, plan? Yeah. Um, th thank you, Councilman, for the question. While the focus of um, what we call water tracks is more on industrial use, I would note that we have, uh, we promote, when we promote um, Cleveland or Cuyahoga County as a place to visit and live, the lake is by far one of our greatest assets, which we do promote. And we do work, of course, with the sewer district. And while we are not the actor in the campaign to, to clean up the lake, we certainly work with and support the work that they are doing. Um, some of our trail work where we're involved with others also takes advantage of the river as an asset. Um, we are, we were, we're going to be out at Irish Town Bend later this month um, as part of the Greater Cleveland Partnerships campaign to promote the region, celebrating the park that's going to be put in Irish Town Bend. So certainly the lake and the river uh, fully exploited as assets for culture and recreation as well. Good, thank you. And I'd be uh, open to that um, two hour discussion uh, chair. So I, I certainly will join you. Good, well, I think you're, hopefully everybody's welcome. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll talk to the, the uh, council president and say whether or not he would want to do that as a uh, maybe a two or two meeting or three meeting incident where you have one meeting dedicated to the ED piece, one one meeting developed to the environmental and make it a committee of the whole, uh, because obviously water is is a, is an important part of wh where we are out there and what it means to us. And I think that uh, uh, we can. Uh, we can all market the fact that it was over 50 years since we had the lake, the river catch on fire, and yet we still hear remnants of that no matter where you are in the world. Oh, yeah, well, why don't you guys wake up? Well, that was 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, that we, we, We've got a great lake, and it's uh, no pun intended, and it's, it's doing good things for everybody. Uh, any other questions or comments regarding to Paul's presentation? What's that? Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Miller. Uh, I know it's late, so I'm going to be uh, very, very brief, but uh, I, I like the uh, new directions that you're, you're moving toward, and I just have, have two... You're mute, David. Dale, you're mute. Dale, you're mute. There you go. I just have two suggestions about uh, how I think the plan should be uh, further specified. Uh, I would like to see a little bit more detail provided about, about the uh, accomplishments during the past year and the, and the key programs, the statistics. I, I think a lot of it was, uh, was well, well presented today, but we should see, see some of that written into the plan. And the second thing is that regarding these uh, new areas of emphasis, I would like to see uh, some specificity about some things you'd like to accomplish in each of these areas over the next year or two as we uh, as we focus on the first couple years of the plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, and I'm not going to speak for Mr. Herdick uh, specifically, but I can tell you that anybody who is in business or in the ED piece, last year was a lot of treading water just to keep your head above water, so it was. Uh, everybody was trying their best to, 
uh, to, to not drown last year. So, and I, I'm not trying to speak of, of the program itself, but I know that it, that, that, that was the number one uh, metric that you try to do was keep, keep your people working and stay above water. Um, so with that, we are almost at the end of our time. I agree with you, Dale. One of the things that I found most interesting, it was their common thread, whether it was Mrs. Uh, Ms. Duckworth, whether it was uh, Mr. Gilbert, uh, um, Mr. Leach, uh, or uh, Mr. Brickner, they all seem to be saying that there is a bonding together where everybody is working together, which is kind of refreshing because it used to be a whole bunch of individuals going in their own way. And you could hear it even in their tone going deeper down in the, into the hospital systems, into the magnet systems. Uh, that was really, really uh, refreshing to hear everybody working together for the, uh, as opposed to a bunch of individual people. So thanks very much. Uh, any other questions based on that, that comment? If I may, uh, Chair, just real quick. Um, another maybe benchmark, Mr. Herdick, that you can take a look at is because we are doing, many of these are new programs, new ideals, new ways of, uh, of trying to recruit. Um, are there any unintended consequences? Are there any um, unintended consequences where we turn away people that we normally perhaps would have helped, but they don't fit the uh, qualifications or um, whatever it is that we're trying to uh, target those that aren't in that targeted group. If you could keep track of how many times you say, uh, I'm sorry, this program, you just don't fit it. We're trying to uh, reach out to the others that, um, you know, we're trying to uh, help and get started and perhaps may not have had the opportunity to before. But an unintended consequence could be that we are turning away those that are perhaps just as much in need, um, but don't fit the criteria of what we're outlining. Thank you, Council Member. And may I say um, briefly, this a little bit touches on one of the comments uh, that my colleague Frank Brickner made, where um, you know when someone behaves well by saving or taking a job, there is a, a perverse consequence that they then are no, no longer eligible. And we seek to avoid that. Um, I will I will repeat, we turn nobody away. We have no programs that are limited to people of a certain race. We will not ever have that. We do offer compensating supports, but we will not turn people away. But certainly one of our goals is to not have artificial barriers, especially for those who are truly in need and to get past kind of rigid rigid regulatory requirements and say, let's truly meet people where their needs are. Thank you, I appreciate that. I just, I know that we're turning into somewhat of a different direction for the percentages of uh, those that uh, perhaps we are trying to reach out to that we didn't before. Yes. And I'm just asking that, is there any unintended consequences that we're turning away those that we would have helped but the resources aren't there because we're saving them for other um, that, are, that we're trying to overcome their circumstances. Well, not necessarily an unintended consequence or, of that, but I think it's a place where uh, the education committee could, uh, could interface in regards to it because Mr. Brickner said that one third of his applicants yeah. are probably hurting because they can't even accept training Right. Uh, because they don't have the skill sets to understand the math or the English or those things. Um, it's just like it's kind of re was refreshing to hear all four of these speakers all saying they're working closer in proximity to each other. Perhaps that's an also a place for ED and uh, education to say, what can we do to it? Uh, Frank, what can we do to identify your one third so we can get them up to speed? And perhaps that's the place that we should be uh, linking uh, that one third that, that is failing to get in the system because they can't get an education or they can't get even get into the training component to get into that function because they're, they're slipped, they slipped someplace in the crack. And so I hope that's a, a, another place where we can be working closer together between ED and education on that. Because they're, they're de genuinely linked. And I was um, sad to hear, he, he said a third of his candidates can't get, can't get past there. One out of yes. three. Yeah. yeah. So 
That's a great idea, Mr. Chair. Good question, colleague Baker. And as you recall, we do, we subsidize through the um, education assistance program, I think 600, 500,000 to workforce for um, workforce training. Maybe we have to talk about, you know, morphing that up a little bit to address what we just heard because, you know, there, there's, there's a disconnect, I think. So we can or, talk about that. Yeah, Frank, maybe, okay. Yeah, maybe we're placing it at the wrong spot. Maybe we need to yeah. be right there at the table. When that person fails on the one side, you're right there uh, to say, okay, you're not going to go to the training right now. Three months, you're going to go to training or six yep. months. Yep. And be That's right. Wonderful. Yeah. Right. Super. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you much, everybody. Uh, this was, I don't know about you folks, but I came out of this uh, really pumped up. Uh, okay. Paul, I don't know whether you're going to get the job. <laughs> Good luck to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, may, may I remind the committee, the committee's, you know, can, if it wishes, recommend the plan back to council for approval. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, point in time. Our timing is such that we've, we, uh, uh, the chair will move that the, the, do you need this on second reading or for is Third regular is reading? Fine. Third is fine, sir. Very good. Uh, the, the chair will move it. Uh, is there a second to move this for a uh, regular session? It was seconded. All, uh, any discussion regards to moving this out of committee? Hearing no discussion. All in favor of moving it out of committee, uh, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, thanks for that, very much for that reminder. The chair let that one slip. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, is there any other matters to be brought before the, the, the committee? And I knew this was going to be a long one, but uh, thanks everybody for sticking it out to five o'clock. God bless you. Thanks. Good meeting.